preparing to live stream. I guess it tells you in the Zoom meeting. Yeah, it's meeting is now streaming live on YouTube. It beats itself. Oh. And then I have to mute myself in the YouTube video. Cool. So I think I'm all set now. Um, I'll give people a chance to tune in to our YouTube channel um, since we start right on the clock and sometimes folks are late coming in to join us and watch on YouTube. So I'll ramble for a little bit first and introduce myself and you first. So, so hello everybody in the YouTube world. My name is Jenny with the Center for Aquatic Sciences. And if you're joining us here at 2 p.m. Eastern time, then you are here for our last guest speaker talk of our World Oceans Week virtual festival. Um, I hope you guys have enjoyed it so far. Um, we've had lots of other guest speakers and we had a concert. We're doing science experiments on Instagram and having all sorts of animal encounters that are virtual with Zoom meetings where it's, we're interviewing animals. It's all been really good fun. And today, right now, we have our final guest speaker, uh, Miss Selena Chen, who's actually calling us from London right now, which is super cool. And um, she's here today as a wildlife conservationist, a photographer, a storyteller, and a photojournalist. Um, also, we have to give her a congratulations, round of applause, as they say in school, because she just graduated with her bachelor's degree. Yeah. Right. And just defended her thesis three days ago, which is super awesome. And you're probably exhausted with all that work. <laughs> so I really do appreciate you coming to talk to us today, like right after all of that work you just did. Um, so we have a couple folks watching now. Before I hand it off to you, I just want to mention to everybody in the YouTube world, uh, if you're watching and you have comments or questions, feel free to type on the chat side to the right of your screen, I believe, and type in your questions there. I'll be keeping my eye on the chat section in the YouTube, and I'll be able to ask on your behalf and, and share your questions with everybody in this meeting on Zoom here. Um, so I guess I've rambled enough. It's been two minutes. Um, so with that, I'll turn it over to you, Selena, and we can get started. Great. Thank you so much, Jenny, for your wonderful introduction. Um, so I thought I'd just start off uh, before I start with my presentation. I thought I would introduce myself. So I'm my name is Selena. I am based here in London in the UK. I'm an um, environmentalist, a conservationist, a photojournalist literally anything or everything. Um, <laughs> but I just graduated with a uh, bachelor's degree in biology and I'm going to do a master's in tropical forest ecology. So I, my background is very much in the sciences. And I started working as a photographer and photojournalist um, as a way to communicate the sciences to the public really. So um, I'm just gonna start sharing my screen here so that I can do my presentation for you. Okay, great. So I'm going to tell you today about conservation photojournalism and what it is, um, what it is and how it can be used uh, to protect wildlife and to protect, um, in the cause for wildlife conservation across the globe. And this doesn't necessarily, it's not limited to photojournalism, but it could also be any form of science communication that usually uses visuals. So whether, you know, it's photography or if you're, even if it's scientific illustration, if it's graphic design, literally anything that has to do with science communication. Oops, hopefully that works. Yes, okay. so. What is, you know, how can we use photography to communicate science? Um, just a few examples here of big magazines or scientific journals such as science using imagery or graphics to convey a message. It's everywhere we look. And, you know, I'm sure you all know the power of advertising um, and uh, advertising in, in general, just visuals. And the thing is we have, a, a crisis on our hands, really. We have the sixth mass extinction. The, the, we're at the beginning of a sixth mass extinction. 
species are going extinct every single day. We face a biodiversity crisis, an ecological crisis, and I'm sure you all know a climate crisis. And scientists have been communicating the urgency of these crises for a very long time. Um, and I've realized in my experience as a scientist and in my experience working in conservation that a lot of the conclusions and figures and data and statistics that scientists propose or provide to politicians and to the public may not necessarily resonate very well. It may not, you know, it's, it's not the best form of communicating the science. And for me, photography is like a universal language. Photography transcends language, it transcends ethnicity and age and cultural background and socioeconomic background and nationality. You don't need to like, you don't need any form of education to be able to look at a photograph and respond to it emotionally. And I find that using photography, you can use people's emotions to stimulate a response. You can provoke change through visual imagery or photography or graphic design. So um, just a few examples here, like for those of you who are not necessarily interested in photography, there's lots of opportunities with other forms of visual medium um, of communicating science and conservation. Oops, every time, okay. Um, and also it's not limited to magazines and editorials and photos because we also have extremely powerful documentaries and extremely powerful um, series that communicate the urgency of, of the time that we live in. And I'm not sure if you guys know, maybe you're not old enough to know the inconvenient truth that, that came out in the early 2000s, but it was really quite a shock um, regarding climate change. And like just last year, David Attenborough released on BBC, The Seven Worlds, One Planet, and just showing people how beautiful our planet is, how beautiful the animals are, and habitats and interactions can really can really affect people in an emotional way. And so we can use that almost like a weapon. You know, we can use our love and our intrinsic curiosity because I believe that, you know, when all of us are born, no matter what, everyone is going to be curious about the world around us. And if we use that to our advantage, we can actually provoke real change in the world. So just to start off about a bit of science communication, um, it's really important to be telling the stories of scientists and what scientists are doing to protect wildlife. And whether that's, you know, for example, this snow leopard being collared or um, telling stories from South Africa, the Kalahari, such as these meerkats, or these Florida Panthers in the US. Um, it's so important to tell the stories of the people that are working tirelessly behind the scenes to enact change. Um, and now more than ever, especially with the rise of the Black Lives Matter movement, it's really important to tell the stories of the people of color that are behind the scenes. The highest rates of biodiversity across the world occur around the tropics. And most tropical countries are not, um, most, they're mostly uh, countries inhabited by people of color or indigenous people. And indigenous people have been protecting biodiversity and protecting wildlife for thousands of years. And we can learn so much from them. So using our photography in the future as well now and in the future, it's really important to highlight the stories of people who are not like us and stories of people who may have a better opinion of how to, to do things in certain ways. Like how can we um, improve on the conservation actions that we are working on now? And I think a really big part of that is diversifying the pool of information that we're, 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 we're um, using. So if you look at a room, and I think this is important for all of you in the future, when you're ever in a room and decisions are being made, you should always ask yourself, who is not in this room? Whose voice is not being heard? Whose opinion are we not hearing? Because 
You never know, their opinion might be extremely valuable and could hold the key to solving the problem, regardless of the, the problem at hand, you know, whether it's ocean conservation, whether it's terrestrial conservation, poaching, or any anything anyone ever faces, really. Um, so here, yes, of course, another example of uh, telling indigenous stories. And now that most of the world's people lives in cities, um, most of us have lost our connection or lost touch with the natural world. And like I said, it's so important that we feel love for nature because we're not going to protect something that we don't love, that we don't have a personal sentimental connection to. Because as unfortunate as it sounds, um, most of the, th the threats facing wildlife and the environment and the climate is fueled by um, money. And quite often you're not going to make more money protecting an environment than you're going to by destroying it. So there, we have to have you know, some intrinsic value on wildlife. We have to have some sort of emotional connection or moral obligation rather than just purely looking at, you know, how much money are we going to make if we protect or we destroy. So as we're all in cities, I think it's really important that we use photography and we use um, the internet and social media to connect people with nature that's far away or across the globe. And People have been doing this for decades. You know, this is Paul Nicklin. He's one of the most established wildlife photographers in the world. And he's been documenting the polar regions. And, you know, like people like me or you, or the likelihood that we're all going to get the chance to go see the Arctic or the Antarctic in our lifetime is very, is not everyone has that opportunity. Not everyone has that privilege. And not everyone has the opportunity to fall in love with beautiful ecosystems that we won't see. Um, so it's really important to use photography this way. You know, this is a clouded leopard in the jungles of Borneo. Just seeing one is so, so difficult. So the, the opportunity for us to, to connect with an animal like this through a photograph and to feel something, you know, wow, look at this beautiful animal that's in a rainforest that's being cut down um, every single day at huge, at extremely rapid rates. Like, what can we do about it? And, you know, wildlife is not limited to uh, the jungles or the oceans. There's wildlife in our cities. And I mentioned, we were talking about this before just a moment ago, that now that everyone's restricted to their homes during the coronavirus pandemic, it's, we, um, like backyard birding has exploded and just being able to look, sit back and like really appreciate the wildlife that we have in our own backyards. This is in India, um, so we don't have leopards in our backyards, but they do in India. <laughs> but you know, just looking at the wildlife that we have here at home, whether you're in the US or whether you're in the UK, looking at the wildlife we have here, everything is worth protecting, no matter how, you know, charismatic or beautiful the animal is, whether you're a toad in a pond here in, in the UK, or whether you're a leopard in South Africa or in South India, it's all important um, to protect. Whether you're a snake or any of these things, you know, like, I think it's really important also to remember in biodiversity conservation that Biodiversity is the variety of all life on earth. And the earth provides certain services and certain functions for um, humanity to live on. You know, the, the soil that we cultivate, the air we breathe, the water we drink. And I'm sure you all know, now that you've learned more about the ocean, is a lot of these things come from processes and relationships that are occurring in, the, in natural environments. And every single species plays a part in these very complex and interconnected processes. So it's regardless of, you know, like I said, regardless of how cute something is, it's really important to consider every single species. And photography 
enables us to form a connection with certain, like, for example, this snake, most people don't like snakes, <laughs> but, um, you know, for allowing a different perspective of these animals that people don't necessarily like. I mean, everyone loves pan pandas, um, but this is, uh, this is a cassowary. Uh, it's a huge bird found in the jungles in Australia. And not many people would even know that this bird existed. Um, and this, you, you know, photography allows us to have a window into this world, um, a window into interesting relationships. And even for animals like insects that we may not necessarily look twice at, um, it's really important to consider every single branch of life, including the fungi and the plants and the flowers that, I, that I'm showing here. Um, so I'm just gonna move through some of these slides and show you some of my favorite works of different photographers. And uh, one of them is this project on vultures in Southern Africa. Most people have like Disney, for example, Lion King paints a pretty um, negative picture of vultures and hyenas and things like that. Animals that don't necessarily have a lot of uh, positive connotations in culture, popular culture, but play an extremely important role in the ecosystem um, and showing photographs of them in new and unique perspectives can pique our interest and interest us in animals that previously people didn't really want to learn more about. And vultures is one of them. And for this is one of my favorite uh, photographers. His name's Thomas Peshak. I really highly recommend some of you look him up. Um, and this is a, on one of the Galapagos Islands where um, these finches, they're called vampire finches, have evolved to consume the blood of seabirds that nest on the island because the island doesn't have any natural bodies of water. And so these birds have evolved over millennia to drink the blood of seabirds on the island. And just like these incredible, fascinating relationships that occur all over the world. You can read about them like, oh, there's a bird that drinks blood and people it's like, okay, that's really cool but it's difficult to you know emotionally connect with something like that. But once you see the photographs, once you see them it opens your heart to, um, to the, like the future possibility of conserving them and protecting them and making sure that they have a chance to, to diversify into the future. Um, so yeah, but of course, one of the greatest examples of how conservation photography can provoke change is this amazing story by Michael Nichols. His name is he's also called Nick Nichols. And he's this photographer, this photographer um, published this story um, a couple decades ago in National Geographic magazine. And it was the first time we had actually seen photographs from the jungles of Central and West Africa. And for example, this is a hippo that is in the ocean. So it's like a surfing hippo. Um, and people had never seen images of these animals before or in this habitat. Forest elephants, which are not quite similar to the big African elephants that you see in more like on the savannas. Um, or mountain gorillas feeding in these beautiful open patches of the rainforest. And these beautiful forest elephants that have very different like faces, I would say, to, to African elephants. And he, Michael Nichols and a scientist that he was with, after doing this enormous ex um, expedition through the jungle and collecting these photographs of never before, never before seen or photographed species, he went to the president of Gabon. And he said, look, look at the beautiful wildlife that you have in your country. Look at the beautiful forests that you have in your country. And it's being destroyed at unprecedented rates right now. And immediately on the spot, the Gabonese president created 13 national parks covering 3 million hectares. Um, so they, because of these photographs, 10% of the entire country of Gabon was protected um, to save some of the species and the forests that, found that were 
witness in these photographs. So this is one of like the most, the clearest um, examples of conservation through photography um, that are out there. But it's just such an inspiring story of how like just showing some of these photographs of these incredible species that no one's ever seen before um, can, to lead, can lead to so much conservation potential. But of course, now a lot of people, like there are very few places in the world where no one has seen a species and no one has seen um, that environment. And now that we're faced with greater urgency to protect the environment and to protect the, the wildlife on our planet, we must also document and, and communicate the threats that biodiversity is facing. And unfortunately, a lot of the time, these threats are really difficult to see. And uh, there's a really amazing phrase that you know one of these photographers have mentioned, his name's Thomas Peshak. And he said, we can use photography to shock people out of their indifference. Because now people, they are so much news happening. There's so much happening in the world. And it's so difficult to, like we have compassion fatigue. It's difficult to, to focus on any one thing. But if you can actually see the consequences of our actions for things that are really abstract, like climate change and the biodiversity crisis, if we can see the direct consequences, perhaps we can use this photography and use these images to provoke change. And so here is um, a photograph of a polar bear taken by Christina Mittermeier. And it was the most, there's a video of this, and it was one of the most viewed and most, uh, most viewed photograph the most liked photograph of a National Geographic's Instagram um, that year, and I think it was 2018. Um, and this shows a polar bear that is starving. And we don't know exactly why, but one of the main consequences of climate change is that the sea ice is um, melting, obviously, and polar bears get most of their food during the winter months on the sea ice. And now that there isn't enough sea ice, they're not getting enough food and lots of polar bears are starving. So this was quite like, this is the face of climate change, they called it the article. Um, sorry. This was winner of wildlife photography of the year, wildlife photographer of the year competition in 2017 or 2018. And it's this, you know, it's shocking photograph by Brent Sturton of a black rhino that was killed for its horn. And again, it's like the face of a crisis. It's the face of the rhino poaching crisis uh, where rhinos, uh, rhino species across the globe, including the rhinos in Asia are going extinct because of the high demand for their horns um, for traditional Chinese medicine in East and Southeast Asia. Here is a tiger, a Sumatran tiger, again, a critically endangered species. And this tells a story of human wildlife conflict. So as humans encroach uh, rainforest habitats or just encroach into the wild space, into wild spaces, um, more, there are more occurrences of human wildlife conflict where humans and wildlife are in conflict over shared resources. So, you know, if a farmer's cattle are killed by predators, going to cause conflict and how can we navigate that and how can we communicate communicate that and how can we tell the story of the animals um, and also of the people who are faced with these challenges. Here's another example of human wildlife conflict um, in Australia, you know, uh, road collisions with wildlife is an extremely common um, consequence of human encroachment and habitat fragmentation. And one of the most powerful conservation photo stories I've ever seen was by Joan de la Maya. Um, and he was photographing these macaques, which are these monkeys in Indonesia who were used as performers. And there's quite a large industry in, in Southeast Asia around selling of the macaques for the pet trade or for the circus trade or for entertainment. And he was able to use his photographs, including this one, which was a winner at the Wildlife Photographer of the Year where millions of people across the world saw this photo. He was able to use that public anger that we all felt from seeing this horrible thing 
and go approach the local government in Indonesia and say, look, you need to ban this. You need to ban the, uh, like the whole idea and notion of using animals for entertainment. And he was managed, he managed to do that successfully. And through his photography, he was able to ban the use of macaques in, on like roadside shows in Indonesia. And many of the macaques were rescued and rehabilitated and released. So, you know, using photography, it can be really difficult and it can be really hard to look at some of these things. But in, in the end, there's always hope and there's always hope for change. And if we use it to provoke change, to provoke real action, um, it's an invaluable weapon in the fight for um, our planet. So and that's our, my introduction about um, conservation photojournalism and conservation photography. And just to introduce myself again, I'm, uh, I'm a photojournalist as well. I am from a little bit of everywhere. So I have heritage in China, um, but I grew up in Italy and Switzerland and in here in the UK. And my parents are Dutch and Canadian. So it's very confusing. Um, but I am extremely passionate about the tropics and telling stories about tropical uh, biodiversity as well as um, how we can have positive conservation outcomes in the tropics. Um, so I've worked across the globe. So this, the photo on the right here, this is in Colombia looking for anacondas. And this is in Florida, um, helping uh, other National Geographic photographers in their stories. And I have also photographed, you know, the illegal wildlife trade of macaques in Indonesia. And also in general, I focus quite a lot on the illegal wildlife trade because as a Chinese person, I really want to tell the story of how the illegal wildlife trade is being perceived by Chinese people as well as the West. So I'm sure you all know with coronavirus, um, we think and we're pretty sure that coronavirus uh, originated from a wet market in China that was selling animals such as this one. This is a, a koi poo, uh, as well as foxes and monkeys and all sorts. Um, but I think a lot of the blame now is finger pointing on China, like, oh, China's doing this and China's the one that's um, causing all this environmental harm across the world, you know, with rhino horns or elephant ivory or um, the illegal trade of lots of these animals. But I think it's really important to show empathy to other people as well as to animals, because when it comes to finding solutions, it's really hard to do so if you're in a very confrontational and negative um, situation. And so I think telling the story from a Chinese perspective, and so my goal is to, to you know, use these photographs, documenting the illegal wildlife trade and what we're doing to animals um, and show them to Chinese people so that we can create change within China um, and build empathy for wildlife as well as for people from other countries and other cultures um, and do so in a constructive way. Um, I've also photographed animals in really horrible situations such as zoos, which is where this was taken an orangutan in a zoo. And this is a golden snub-nosed monkey in a zoo because I'm also very passionate about um, wildlife captivity. And I, I'm sure you all have seen Tiger King by now, um, but for me, like what, was really important to me is we need to make sure that those tigers or these, these monkeys and these animals that are in cages also have a voice and we can do so um, through photography. And uh, of course, like I said, I'm passionate about the tropics and one of the biggest issues in the tropics is deforestation and uh, how we can document that in new and compelling ways to, to convince people um, that there's another way uh, to sustainable development. And of course, last but not least, uh, as you know, I also document and photograph the beautiful things because as much as we can shock people out of their indifference, uh, we can also sell love. Like I said, people are not gonna protect something that they, they don't love and they don't feel a connection to. So I also love photographing animals in their 
natural habitats, doing their natural behaviors, um, like these two orangutans playing, um, to highlight, you know, what's at stake and all the beautiful things that we have in this world. And there's so much worth fighting for. There's so much left that's worth fighting for and so much beauty in the world that's worth protecting. Um, so uh, yeah, that's what I do. And I hope that some of you would be inspired to use photography um, in your own ways uh, to protect what you love no matter what it is, because photography can be so, so powerful to, to tell these stories and give these animals and give the environment a voice in this crazy, crazy world. <laughs> so yeah, thank you very much, everyone. And I'm happy to answer anyone's questions. Wow, that was amazing. Thank you so much for sharing all these photos. <laughs> if only my face was visible and on camera like you would have seen all the emotions and reactions going across <laughs> my face and even some exclamatory audible sounds as well um, so i really do appreciate it i hope everybody else in this call and everybody else on the youtube was definitely going wow beautiful amazing commenting on things like i'm so glad um, but so yeah I'm I'll happy to answer questions yeah is it anybody here first would like to ans ask a question feel free to go ahead I'll look over at the YouTube. I know we do have some questions over there as well. Okay. I'll give everybody in here first a chance while I read. Okay. okay. So our first YouTube question is from Jim. Mm -hmm. And he asks, what is your dream photography trip? My dream photography trip. Okay. So there's, um, there's, there are two types of trips you would say there's one that it's just like oh i'm going on holiday and i really want to photograph something that's really beautiful and that's really fun or there's like the type of trip and what it's more what i do is how can i use this most effectively to create change um and so for now i think both there's a great mixture of both uh, in Borneo. And one of my favorite places in the whole world is Borneo. And I, I'm hoping to do some research there myself. And I actually have been working on a story um, in Borneo because you have some of the most biodiverse ancient rainforests in the whole world with hornbills and orangutans and clouded leopards and pygmy elephants and all sorts of beautiful insects and stuff <laughs> that I don't really know much about. <laughs> but um, but at the same time, you're on the front lines of the battle for our environment because at the same time, that forest is being destroyed at unprecedented rates. That forest is being set on fire. There are people going into those forests and hunting animals, um, mostly because they need to put food on the table. We should also remember that. Um, so there's so much potential um, and so many stories to be told in that situation. So that's, I would say, I love Borneo. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I see Maddie here has a question. Why don't you pop on and ask your question, Maddie? Hey, uh, so I totally agree with you. I thought it was really cool that you talked about like the shock factor, because I think that's really important. Like, I think a lot of times people, like they don't care about something if it's not in their own backyard, really. Mm -hmm. uh, but as a photographer, was there anything that like, while you were taking that picture that really shocked you personally, like really stuck with you? Oh, like while I was taking some of those photos? Yeah, like something you took that like really stands out to you as the most shocking okay. like, in our photo. Let me share my screen with you again. So this photo, I'll go back to it. It's one of the most dis difficult photos I've ever taken in my life. And one of the most difficult experiences I've ever had in my life. Um, because here I was in this like private zoo um, and this magnificent creature that I have seen in the wild. I have seen orangutans in the wild. I have seen them in the tropical forests of Southeast Asia. And I, I have a really strong um, connection with them just because, you know, they're some of our closest cousins. They're so intelligent. They have, they form these, they have these, they're just so smart, you know, like <laughs> they're so much like us. And when you look at them in the face, like you can, you can really feel someone else looking back at you. Um, and here I was trying to photograph the cruelty 
facing these animals. And um, here was this magnificent orangutan in a concrete room, as you can see, with nothing, like nothing at all. And he was drinking um, like an iced tea out of a plastic bottle that people had thrown at him. And he actually had like a, a bed, you know, those like metal spring beds, but with no mattress. Because like, it's, it's, and it's funny because in that way, like the zookeeper was actually acknowledging how human he was. Like, oh, he's not gonna need a nest or like trees or anything. He's gonna need a bed, you know, it makes no sense. And this poor animal was shaking at this door, like, let me out, please. And I was mortified because here I am standing behind the bars in the glass and there are hundreds of people walking past, hundreds of people banging on the windows, like do something yelling at him, throwing things at him. And I couldn't do anything. Like I just had to stand, stand there and I mean, scold people and like yell at people because I'm obviously not one that's gonna just let people treat an animal this way. But I was, at the same time, I'm undercover. And so like, I can't, if I show my opinion too much I can get kicked out. Um, and just hope that by taking this photograph I can do something for this whole industry and for maybe not this orangutan, maybe not, but maybe for other orangutans in the future and maybe other animals and zoos in the future. But it's a moment where you feel so utterly, utterly helpless. Um, and quite frankly, it's really traumatizing because when you love something so much, it's really, really difficult to see them suffer like that. Thank you. You're welcome. I'll scroll to a nicer photo. <laughs> All right, so I've got another question from our YouTubers. Yeah. Um, and Gretchen asks, of all the animals that you have photographed, have you ever had a photo session where it was dangerous and maybe your life was threatened? Um, yeah, I mean, I think it's important to remember, okay, the most dangerous situations I've ever been in where I've literally had my life threatened was with other human beings. So I always say the most dangerous animals in the world are people. Um, and as a scientist, like if you're a biologist or if you're with biologists and with guides and you're, if you're taking photographs ethically and responsibly, because there are plenty of photographers out there who they just want the photo. So they get clo too close and they, get, they, you know, um, they scare the animal or they make it uncomfortable, then you're putting yourself in a dangerous situation. But there are very few situations where the animal themselves will just lash out at you for no reason unexpectedly. Usually as you know, as if you know animal behavior well enough, you can tell like, okay, this animal's nervous or uncomfortable, we should probably step away and just leave it alone. So I think it's, um, I mean, if you want an experience in particular, I was once chased up a tree by a deer. <laughs> So it's not like a lion or anything, but but um, it was chasing me, and it was a lot of it was quite scary at the time. It had lots, it had very big antlers, and then I was stuck in this tree throwing sticks at this deer, <laughs> trying to to get away. But yeah, otherwise it's just people. Like when I've run into um, people that are illegal loggers or people who are trying to trap animals in the forest, and they know they're not supposed to be there. That can get very scary. Yeah. Um, I agree with what you said about taking photos responsibly and ethically. Um, I don't think that gets said a lot. And I mean, no. what a lot of people say is like you go to the beach or go into nature and you leave footprints and take photos, but don't take anything else. And that's about the extent of that message. It yeah. doesn't really get explained further. Yeah. So, thank you for saying that in different words. Of course, no, it's so important, everyone. You always have to, okay, you always have to put the well-being of the animal before your photo. That's so important because then what's the point? What, why are you taking the photo at all? You know, it, then you're just doing it for yourself and you're not really doing it for, for the animals. Yeah. Sure. Mm -hmm. um, I see in our conversation here that Taylor has a question or a couple of questions. Would you like mm -hmm. to jump on Taylor? Sure. Hi. Um, so yeah, first I agree with everything you've said, especially taking pictures responsibly, respecting the animals and everything you said about, especially um, how much the biodiversity in the world is 
in the tropics of, with um, where people of color live and how they respect the environment. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, like I looked at your photos and they're breathtaking. To say they're breathtaking is an understatement because they're so gorgeous and stuff like that. And what you said also has, I have a lot of respect for what you said and it's really awesome. And um, my question is just like, what was, uh, where was like the first place you went to take pictures? And um, where was the most recent you went? And if anything has like your attitude or your approach to the pictures or your emotions or anything has changed along the way or anything like that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, the first place I went that was like an official, like I'm a photographer now. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah that's, I, what, that's what I mean, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, because I, I was working in conservation before. So I had been, I took a, a year out be between high school and university and I mm -hmm. worked as a research assistant with Panthera. I, you know, I did internships as a scientist as well as a conservation in many places and I never had my camera with me. Mm -hmm. um, but the first place I did actually like consider taking on photography was, um, was in Madagascar. Mm. And which is, like a dream for most people, like yeah, really it's anyone. yeah, it's one of the most fascinating, incredible places in the world. But at the same time, it's one of the most depressing places I've ever been because mm -hmm. I, I don't know if any of you know, but like Madagascar has like only, I think 2% of its forests or its original forests are left standing. So 98% of their entire natural habitat has been destroyed. Um, and some of the, and all the species, almost all of the species that you find in Madagascar, you don't find anywhere else in the world. So it's really quite, it's very like urgent because, you know, every time you see a family of lemurs, for example, like I was there and I saw a family of injury, it was like, this could be the last generation of injury left on this planet. This could be the last, or just, there are only a handful of these animals left and you're seeing them now and you're in this forest, but if you just walk like a couple hundred yards in that direction, it's going to, you're going to hit a farm or a road or a, or a town. So it's, I think that was when I realized like, look, this is, this is what I need to do. And this is how, how I'm going to do it. Um, and most recently I was in Borneo <laughs> because uh, I've been, I'm working on a story there and from like the time in between going to Madagascar and to Borneo, I have grown enormously as a person as well as a conservationist and a scientist because at the same time like throughout this period I was at university and I a lot of the things that I believed when I went to Madagascar in the beginning like I believe I was absolutely certain of so many things you know like palm oil is bad and and zoos are bad and um I also what did I, I like this is the sixth mass extinction and you know yeah. everything going to die and I had I had a lot of conviction and these ideas and I realized as I went to university that once you study the science and once you really look at things critically knowing the scientific background you can like there's a lot more opportunity to see solutions I feel because it doesn't look so dire like yes the science is saying that it's the beginning of mass extinction but we're not quite there yet you know and um and that that's if anything that's hopeful you know um yeah. and I think there's a lot of things that like a lot of campaigning and a lot of NGOs and a lot of uh, media they 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 sell not they, they they don't sell but they say these huge blanket statements or one-liners and they try to convey very complex um issues and um in very like simple black and white terms and if anything we should be focusing on how nuanced everything is everything is so nuanced like yes palm oil is responsible for lots of rainforest destruction but at the same time there is uh, people in tropical regions are not going to protect forests if they can't have an economy, if they can't put food on the table. And what's a really efficient and fast way of doing that is by developing a palm oil economy. Like 
as hard as it sounds. And so it's really, it's important. I think also what I've learned along the way is to bring people into conservation. And like, as we're learning now, especially with Black Lives Matter, especially with Black Birders Week, for example, like we cannot have sustainable biodiversity protection and sustainable environmental justice without social justice. And a lot of conservation is about bringing people out of poverty in areas where you have high rates of biodiversity. Because if the people aren't, um, you know, if the people aren't eating, <laughs> if there's no food on the table and if, if kids aren't going to school, if girls aren't going to school, then of course, people aren't gonna be uh, prioritizing protecting the environment over their own livelihoods. So that's how I've changed as a person. <laughs> and I think it's really important. I just like my main message uh, would be to like, remember that everything is nuanced and nothing, nothing is just like black and white. There's so much gray area and we should embrace it. We should embrace the gray area and try to find solutions in that gray area because there are so many solutions um, out there and it's not, there's no, like there's never a moment where we can say that there is no hope left. Yeah. It was so well said. And uh, just like, <laughs> it just, it was, it was. And just like you said, how not everything's black and white, just like in the photos you take, how you photographed the good and the bad. Whereas like, there's like the picture with the vulture right in the eating the uh, dead animal, like, yeah. Like you said, Disney has a negative connotation of them, but they're so necessary to the environment because they're Absolutely. cleaning up their scavengers. And also, like you, like you, like um, like you also said, how the more um, quote unquote depressing pictures, like with the orangutan, in the for each picture like that, there's a also a picture of the majestic elephant, the jungle elephant, exactly. like you said. So it's exactly. yeah, I agree with everything you've said. So thank you so much. Happy to help. <laughs> Cool. Thank you so much. Um, we do have a couple more minutes and about two more questions. Our last one from the YouTube world. Um, you might not want to answer because it might blow your cover. Um, but Jim asks, how do you get into the places where, where the illegal animals and the illegal pet trade is happening? Yeah. To take your phone. Oh, it's super easy. Um, <laughs> it's just, so you have to blend in, uh, which luckily um, lots of this work is in Asia, uh, Southeast Asia and in China in particular. And I speak Chinese and I speak lots of the, I speak um, some Malaysian Bahasa, so I can speak Indonesian. Um, and um, I'm also a woman of color and one of the very, very few women of color who are in photography. Like I can literally name you for others. Um, so, women <laughs> get into this industry. Um, but um, I blend in and people, a lot of these countries, um, they have lots of tourists. And um, so I just pretend to be a tourist of like a witless tourist, like, oh, I just I stumbled into the wrong room. Or I pretend to be um, a buyer because lots of the buyers are from China. And that's, I mean, that's not overly complicated. Um, or if it's just a zoo, like unfortunately, sometimes you have to pay to get into that area. And it's all about weighing, you know, the cost and the benefit. Like, yes, I am supporting this by paying for a ticket, but what can I do with the photos that I'm going to come out of here? I can destroy this, <laughs> this whole business with these photos, you know? So, um, so yeah, but it's always very dangerous. Don't try this at home without experience. Because I, I, um, I don't know if you have seen the movie Racing Extinction, um, but they also do like covert operations. And I um, did an internship with them. And so they trained me in some of the de-escalation exercises and things like that. And I always have a button camera on me to collect evidence just in case something goes wrong. Wow. But yeah. So it's almost like you're a spy or a spy in training. <laughs> A spy for animals yeah <laughs> no um. Um, so we I see I see in our meeting we have one more question from Michelle who typed it a long time ago but I wanted to give everybody else a chance first um, right. Michelle would you like to ask your question hello uh, so I think you may have already sort of answered it but I'm kind of thinking about like I think a lot of us who um, 
go into this field, go into biology or conservation, have like one moment either in childhood or early on that like sparked it. Um, do you have like that moment that just kind of sparked you to just go in this direction? Um, I, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, the thing is, I always get asked this question and it's, I think for me, it really is like I was just born with this innate obsession, and I say obsession, um, with with wildlife. And um, it started out with just like loving wildlife. And that's why I wanted to study biology. Um, but once you put the, that into the context of the world that we live in now, with the context of the crisis, the, all these crises that we face, and just realizing also, I think partly on the fact that I am um, partly Chinese and a lot of these issues, like I mentioned, like with illegal wildlife trade, a lot of the demand comes from China. So I feel like I have a responsibility really to, to convey the Chinese opinion and to say like, look, not all of China is like this and not everyone is like this because unfortunately, especially with coronavirus, there's a lot of like racist backlash, quite frankly, on um, Chinese people or East Asian people for this kind of, you know, the, the illegal wildlife trade. Um, and so I think it's also just really important to, I feel like it was my responsibility to communicate this to, you know, the Western public in Europe and in the US, but also to communicate it like where, you know, right from the horse's mouth, where we need to be communicating this. And I thought like, look, I have the skills, I can speak both languages and I can um, try and, and be a bridge for this. But again, I feel like I was born with this obsession because I, I grew up in Beijing a city of 20 something million people. There is no wildlife in that city. <laughs> so I remember when I like on holidays to Europe, for example, because my family, I have some family here in Europe. Like the first time I saw um, a crow, I was like, oh my God, this is the biggest bird I have ever seen in my life. Like, this is so cool. So every tiny thing, like a grasshopper or a swan or a duck or something that other people think is really normal. I was like, oh my gosh, this is amazing. So, so I think that also was partly responsible. Yeah. Thank you. No problem. Oh my goodness. Well, we're just about out of time. I wanna thank you again so much for talking to all of us here in this meeting, as well as on YouTube. Um, you totally touched the heartstrings of me and according to the comments on YouTube, all of our viewers over there. So mission accomplished. Yay. Um, <laughs> Thank you so much for having me. And I just wanted to say like, if anyone has any questions, please feel free to reach out to me on social media. Um, and I think you'll provide the links for that, but I'm like really open and accessible. You can just send me a direct message. If you have any questions, I'm happy to answer. Yes, um, in relation to that, I did post your website and your Instagram handle in the chat discussion on YouTube. So now Great. everybody will know because they were asking to Great. see more of your photos. Oh. Um, I also just want to say that this is a great way to close out World Oceans Week because conservation biology is not black and white. Like you said, it's not yeah. just the science, it's, you know, economics, it's exactly. social sciences, it's cultural beliefs, and it's a conversation, really, yeah, with a whole bunch exactly. of different peoples of different backgrounds. Um, so this is perfect. And I, again, I thank you so much for joining us. Um, this is Selena over here, over there in front of me on the screen. Um, my name is Jenny, again, with the Center for Aquatic Sciences as part of World Oceans Week Virtual Festival. And believe it or not, we have more things coming for everybody on our Facebook page with some live trivia and a concert later on tonight. So I hope that everybody in the YouTube world will tune in on Facebook for that. And with that, thank you so much, everybody in YouTube. I'm going to sign off here. Thank you so much, everyone.